Welcome, um, everybody, back to the Siegel Talks here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center, uh, CUNY, um, out of Manhattan, um, still the epicenter of the COVID uh, uh, monumental crisis, the tsunami, the uh, disaster um, which we are experiencing. And um, we here um, at the Siegel Center, as always, um, uh, are um, a place where we listen to the voices of artists um, and we create a dialogue between academia and professional theater artists and uh, the experimental scene and the establishment, but also international and American theater. We have done that for over 10, 15 years. Thousands of artists went through our rooms and um, we felt that especially now in a time of uh, a crisis and a time of uncertainty, uh, it is um, important to, to continue what we're doing and even more important to hear from artists, as we said uh, in all our other emissions too, um, they are on the right side of justice, on the right side of history and the right side of progress throughout, throughout centuries. And one wishes uh, people in positions of power would listen carefully and closely to what artists say, what they experience, the meaning they create, and what they try to teach us, what they often foresee in their work, what they, as Roncière would say, they anticipate the future, they have that gift, and um, try to put it into a form to make us uh, more comfortable with it, to reflect, and to also understand that perhaps we live not even in the present, but mostly in the past, and we should be alive, we should be in the moment. Uh, with us today, we have a, a, um, and a very important guest for, from India, um, after um, Abhishek Mombar and uh, Anna Rupa Roy is the second time we hear from this great, large, vast and significant country we do not hear enough from, we do not know enough. One of the oldest tradition of theaters in the world, uh, going back from the Katakali dancing to the Sanskrit theater, uh, one of the earliest forms of recorded theater and, and uh, form that are still practiced. Um, so um, I welcome <clears throat> with us, uh, with us, uh, Suleika Chowdhury, and uh, as thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. Carol Martin said, you know, Frank, you have to talk to her. You have to listen um, to her. Your work um, is uh, significant, is important. Uh, you uh, actually base your work on um, the idea of lived experience and memory and uh, the truth production or how. Uh, truth and the law and theater, how can it all be performed? And uh, law and performance uh, um, is, is in a way uh, what we are doing now. We perform uh, to, be, to be COVID uh, uh, participants and we, uh, there's a social choreography going on to stay in our houses, how we can go out, how not, the distance, what we wear, the mask like in theater and uh, we experiencing it all in a very different way. We had to just this week calls from uh, Hungary, this disastrous situation uh, uh, where people were forced, 60% of people had to force to leave hospital beds. We heard uh, yesterday from Romania where the police is going into Roma houses without any reason, beating up women, children and others uh, because they think they are the ones who brought the COVID virus. It's, it's, it is a disastrous uh, what happens in many parts. Others are doing so well like South Korea or we heard from Taiwan, even South Africa. Basil Jones told us, you know, that things are under control. All alcohol shops are closed. You cannot smoke, no cigarettes. And these are, things are tough, but they are, they are going well. So how is it in India? When we heard last from Anurupa and Abhishek, it also was very, very traumatic. Uh, so tell us a little bit what is happening in New Delhi. That's, I guess, where you are and what time is it? Uh, it's now about 9.35 p.m. Um, and... Well, the situation in India is that, as you know, as both Abhishek and um, Anurupa mentioned, we have been, uh, we're in lockdown. Uh, in the last two days, the lockdown is theoretically supposed to have uh, been not so locked down. So we've opened up, uh, which means that um, private businesses can function at 33%, for example, uh, domestic help, uh, can come back to work. Um, I think there's no buses, there's no public transport. So this means that people who have their own cars or, uh, you know, bikes, etc., can um, sort of slowly go back to work because 
it's a large you know everybody has to work uh, uh, and you know, as everywhere else, the economy isn't so hot. Um, this has kind of happened at a time where we're also just beginning, I think, to begin to peak. So in the last, I think, two days, three days, I think yeah, by yesterday, we were up to 50,000 cases. Um, I think yesterday, Delhi had 500 new cases. Um, so it's a bit, uh, I think everybody is in a bit of, partly in a bit of shock because um, everybody is worried. Uh, the alcohol shops opened yesterday after I think 42 days uh, and immediately there were huge uh, queues. There was no social distancing. Nobody was wearing masks. Um, I think some, I think Bombay has shut down again if I'm not mistaken. Uh, mm -hmm. Delhi is still open. The cases um, I, I heard in Gujarat, in the city of Ahmedabad, have uh, there are they're completely locked down. For example, I think only chemists are open uh, and very basic Pharmacies. supplies. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I think everybody is a bit tense uh, and a bit concerned. Uh, because we are just beginning to peak. We're just starting, you know, uh, starting there. Um, the, the situation with um, the migrant labors has been, as you know, also from Abhishek and Anurupa, uh, quite an ongoing uh, concern. Tell us more, because I'm sure not, not everybody was listening. Tell us a little bit about that situation. Well, when the lockdown happened... How long uh, was that ago? How many weeks have you been in lockdown? Uh, I think we went into lockdown on the 25th of March, if I'm around there, about the 25th of March. And the lockdown happened actually in four hours. So we were given four hours to prepare ourselves. Four hours. Yes, we were given Incredible. four hours uh, to prepare ourselves. Um, which meant that work suddenly stopped, of course. And so, you know, all the big metros uh, and of course other parts of the country have labor from elsewhere. Uh, and uh, since the work stopped, they were, you know, a lot of people just had nowhere to go. Um, everybody also wants to go back home. Uh, and so, you know, in time when they ran out of food and they ran out of money, uh, there was a rather biblical long march home that um, the labor was trying to do. Is that true uh, that about 500,000 people tried yeah. to get back on their yeah. feet? Some prepared to march a thousand kilometers without food with children on their back? Yes, it, it was really quite, um, I mean, it was sort of a bit uh, impossible to imagine. Did you see uh, that happened, with your own eyes? You saw that? Um, no, uh, no, there's there's nothing uh, in in the colony that I live, but you know it's a colony, so we wouldn't. And I'm inside, so I wouldn't see it. I think Anurupa stays. She saw uh, that, yeah. Uh, yes, um, but of course we all knew that. Um, and then the the states in India themselves went into a lockdown, so nobody could leave the state. So um, there were a lot of people, I think they were, that of course, who couldn't cross the border. I think some managed to, out, some managed to walk, um, but not everybody. Uh, and so they've been uh, at the borders and the government has put them into shelters, um, but- so, so not everybody could, once the borders closed down, like between New Jersey and New York, they said, you can't go through us, you yeah. will bring the virus. So they'd stop and they also couldn't get back to the families because the families were on lockdown. They can't have changes. So they were, so they are camps with tents at the borders or um, well, hundreds I think, of thousands of people? Yes. So I think schools were repurposed. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think go downs were repurposed. But of course, I think the, um, uh, it was not very high. I don't think it's been very hygienic from the stories that have come out. Sure. Also, too many people, also not enough food. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, random outbreaks of violence, um, 
which uh, is very disturbing. Uh, what kind of violence? Uh, well, I think because people, because people didn't have don't have food uh, because it's really unhygienic because you know nobody can be on the point talk to their families because they don't have enough money on their phones they just don't have money. Um, and so, of course, it causes a great amount of stress because nobody knows what's going to happen. I mean, I can imagine if, you know, for all of us, it's a stressful situation. It sounds pretty, you know, it sounds really horrific. Yeah. Um, in the last two or three days or two days, I think um, the government has um, is sending people back now slowly from the shelter. So back to their homes. Um, With but buses it, or? Um... Uh, I think trains and buses, I believe, but, you know, they've been charged fares, which is a bit difficult to imagine how, how, how would they would pay for something, mm -hmm. how they would pay for a ticket. So that's uh, been quite uh, distressing to hear. Um, I, you know, and of course, you have to get uh, apparently you have to get a letter saying or a piece of paper a certificate saying that you don't have coronavirus you need f a photograph and of course I don't know how anybody can and not everybody it. can yes do this so of course there's a and are there tests available I mean it's unimited like people stuck in tents uh, 200 or 300,000 of course it, it is the condition for a virus to spread so and uh, so it's well, all like absurd yeah, so I mean, like with other countries, I mean, I think we're severely under testing and then there's severe under reporting. So it's very difficult to really get a sense of correct numbers. Um, Delhi has had several containment areas. So if they, if they found a, you know, a street or a neighborhood that has one or two people, then they've sealed off the neighborhood. So it means that you can't exit well, you basically can't get out of your house and, you know, there are police everywhere. So not, nobody can come in, nobody can go out. Um, and um, there are basic services of supplies that are made that are home delivered. Um, but the situation, I, I'm curious about what will happen because as I said, we're just about peaking, um, you know, and so it's difficult to understand actually what's going on. I also just before we got on was reading something which said that, and I'm not sure if this is true or not. I mean, if the article is uh, true or not, but it said that in India, it's, you know, a lot of young people are getting affected. The average age is about 35. Um, well, also, incredible. yeah, also apparently we're taking more than 14 days to show symptoms. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems to be another kind of strain, perhaps. Um, so it's a little difficult to get a sense of actually what's going on. Side by side, uh, I, I, I'm, I read reports that the labor doesn't want to, while we've opened up and it is possible for construction work to continue, uh, labor now, uh, migrant labor doesn't want to stay in the city. So they really want to get back home, which means that there's going to be, you know, there are going to be various kinds of problems um, forthcoming. Yeah, this is uh, just um, incredible. Yeah, and uh, this is the big fear that this virus that up until now has been so uh, stable um, that it didn't change. There are tiniest mutations, if I understand right, and normally often a virus self-destructs or mutates. Um, that's why some people say, well, it must come from a lab. Nobody knows, of course, for real at the moment. But, um, and then, and yeah, that based on DNA, there is a different a reaction to it. It's not, a, one cannot understand why some countries are so infected, others not. Uh, in the US, uh, perhaps, yes, it's all catastrophic uh, uh, management. And there are many, many reasons for that, but uh, still other countries are not experiencing it on, um, on that level, so there is so much um, uncertainty. But uh, from what you describe, uh, it, it is the most severe uh, a case from all the countries we have spoken to, and I assume we have by now spoken to about almost, I think, twenty-five uh, different uh, artists uh, from countries. Only yesterday we heard from uh, Romania. We also 
a migrant laborer was not allowed to come back or not encouraged to come back, but they don't have the families they work for because they can't be in their homes in Austria or Germany. On the other hand, seasonal workers are needed uh, in, in Germany and Austria and the uh, workers and the companies who lean the, lease them out uh, protested. So they were allowed to go back. And even so everybody in Romania and Bucharest has to stay in their house. There were a thousand people at the airport without masks, without um, uh, to uh, social distancing. So it's a chaotic uh, system. But uh, the numbers um, that we hear from India that 500,000 people just in New Delhi alone tried to march uh, home and then couldn't go on uh, and without food. It's uh, I admire everybody who helped. I know Abhishek said uh, he had a list of 1,000 families for one evening where he could choose where to deliver the food from, from the food bank he supports. You talked that you live in the art colony. Is that a colony of artists? Is that the one Anarupa mentioned where you live? No, no, no. I, I don't live at the art colony. I, you know, Delhi is yes. the res residential. Colony means neighborhood or? Um... Yes, it's a neighborhood. It's a neighborhood. Yeah. Where do there you is... live? What neighborhood is it? Um, well, it's uh, in South Delhi and it's a residential neighborhood. Um, and uh, it's a, well, it's an upper middle class neighborhood. So if I was to look out of my window uh, and go go out onto my balcony, it it's just, it seems very calm and quiet. There are people who go for evening walks. Um, are you allowed to go out? Or do, you do you have to wear masks? Uh, we do have to wear masks. We do, um, you know, yeah, you have to wear masks. I mean, nobody can force you to wear a mask. There are, there are some people who don't. Mm -hmm. um, you can, basically, you really can't go outside um, the neighborhood um, very much because the cops can, you know, stop you. You're supposed to get a pass um, uh, to indicate why you are going where you're going. Um, but, I mean, when you look outside, and I think that's the, that's, I think that's the point as well that you know in some neighborhoods like mine I have you know all my supplies come uh, to my house I don't really have to go outside um, and you know it's quite relaxed there's no sense of what's happening in other parts of the city uh, at all and because you can't go you know you can't really leave your neighborhood Although I, I believe in the last two days since we have opened up, traffic has come back a bit. Mm -hmm. But you don't really get a sense of um, what, you know, what's, what's really kind of outside. And that really depends on where you live. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, we all experience it differently and which is highlights the, the injustice in the world between classes and, uh, and social groups and uh, what was wrong before is now uh, uh, being um, being so open, you know, as think Richard Schechner said, is an yeah. open nuclear reactor fusion, a catastrophe, but we are above it, we look at it and um, it is um, disastrous. It's strange to think that you say we are peaking, but on the other hand, the government opens up that people can take a bus where it's impossible to have social no, not, distancing. Not public, not public transport. But, but taxi. It, uh, yes, apparently taxis, you can apparently take them. Apparently taxi, from, yeah. Um, and, you know, you can have one person in the front, two people at the back. Mm. And um, there are no fines. Yesterday we heard from Romania overnight, uh, the Prime Minister said everybody who doesn't wear a mask has to pay up to 5,000 euros, which is impossible for people to pay, especially, of course, minorities um, like Roma or others um, in, 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 in Romania. So um, it is um, uh, disconcerting what we hear. So for you, you are a theater artist. Um, how do you see that? How do you experience this? Um, well, I do want to say that actually, um, you know, this situation is, India has, uh, you know, has been going through uh, what we've been, I feel, in a state of kind of, uh, in an exceptional state now for some time, uh, from, uh, I would say, for the last some years. Um, because, uh, you know, there have been a series of things that have happened in the, within the last year, in, in August last year. Um, I don't know if, you're, if you know or not, the government, um, um, you know, repealed uh, 
the law in Kashmir, the you know, which made it, mm-hmm. which is Kashmir has had a special. Tell our, tell our listeners again, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kashmir has had a special status, uh, and the government sort of basically repealed that status, making it you know, it has no. It, it's part of India now and does not have, whereas previously from independence, it has, it has had, it has had, it's it had the option, at least theoretically of deciding whether it wants to be part of India or not. Uh, and this was repealed, uh, Article 370, which was repealed very suddenly. Um, Kashmir went into lockdown. Um, yeah, great provocation, were, yeah. Uh, there, were, there were protests then. Even cell phones were shut down. People could not uh, use no it. Internet, internet was shut down. All of a sudden, yeah. of course, the Muslim minority, you know, was was uh, suffering, and it's a clearly nationalist policy, right? Uh, yes, and then we've had, which I think Anurupa spoke about, we had the anti-CAA and anti-NRC protests uh, starting against the government. Yeah. Um, Yes, so I mean the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, basically says that minorities from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Afghanistan who so who are Sikhs, who are Christians, who are Parsis, who are Jains, and who are Hindus um, get can get uh, citizenship in India, but not Muslims. This in uh, this in tandem with the National Register of Citizens, Citizen National Reg- Register of Citizens. Um, it, the combination of that has worried people that um, um, minorities. Um, can be made illegal immigrants. So basically- People who lived there for generations, right? People who lived in India for generations. So basically- Have no passport, cannot prove. Well, you have to have the the government outlined, and this was, this happened in Assam, which is in the Northeast, and they have a list of documents which you need to have. Now, of course, not everybody has documents. um, And so a huge amount of people were then just uh, you know there would there are there are detention camps in Assam, um, and so the combination of the two. And uh, then I think in November last year, the Home Minister said, "Now this would apply to the the whole country," and so there have been huge protests all over the country um, about this. Uh, and it's so it's 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 been an you know it's been a series of things in February. Um, because of a clash between the anti-CAA and pro-CAA protesters. I don't know if you heard, but while uh, President Trump was here, there were riots in Northeast Delhi, again, targeting the, uh, the Muslim minority. And so it's been a series of um, very, very difficult moments. Uh, we've had protests nonstop. Um, there's been violence against students, violence against uh, Muslims, um, and one after the other. So it feels like coronavirus is one more thing in the, you know, in the midst, uh, on top of all of this. And of course, during this time, for example, um, activists have been jailed who participated in um, these protests, um, Muslim young scholars and students and activists who participated and who were part of coordination committees um, have been jailed, uh, you know, within the last 10 days. And so it's one actually been one thing after another. And it's been in some ways, uh, I, I feel a really important time uh, the the protests happening were very very powerful. They were most. I I don't know if you heard of Shaheen Bagh and other um, protest sites where, 
for the first time, Muslim women came out. The, mm-hmm. the majority of the protesters were Muslim women, mm-hmm. some very old, uh, other students. Um, these were, uh, you know, and uh, it it's it it was very powerful. Yeah. It also very um, in a way. Uh, I don't want to use the word exhausting, but everybody was really going to multiple protests in a day because it was you know it's been important to show up for solidarity and just be there because bodies matter and this presence matters. Um, and in a way, it has been. Um, for me, also a very uh, important moment to think about what theater does, because in many of the, the protests I attended, you know, and these protests have, of course, there's a coming together, there's a shouting of slogans, there's been music, there's been art, um, and there has been a kind of coming together as a community around, or communities around the ideas, um, that are in our constitution. Um, And it's very performative, right? Uh, And to be part of that way, you are part of, uh, of, of something equally imagined, but equally real. Mm -hmm. And you participate in that. For me, it's really been a moment I really did at that point, which was through December, January, February, really have to, um, I've really been thinking about this question of, in a situation like this that is so powerful and works with similar ideas of if you can imagine it and if you can perform it, if it becomes, you know, in that way it becomes real, then it has possibilities and that played out, you know, in 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 forums like this. I, I've really thought about what does it then mean to make theater? Um, um, I also went, uh, there was a tribe, a people's tribunal, um, which was about the, uh, the police action in one of the states, Uttar Pradesh, where there was immense police brutality. And it was really interesting because I was there with a whole bunch of activists and, um, you know, it was a proper people's tribunal. And it was, again, very, very moving and very, very powerful up until the point where, you know, one of the judges said, and because it was situated very close to the Supreme Court, said, I wonder what this means to the Supreme Court, whatever, you know, whatever we say today, will it make any difference? And so I feel that um, it's, it, you know, A, it's a moment to really think about what one does um, in terms of what is the material that one uses, what is the form one takes, and I think more importantly, who does one perform to? I feel this is a very important question, um, you know, and something very much that I am trying to uh, think through. Uh, so, I mean, this moment is, I feel a pause, it's not a stop. It's a pause in some way because one can't do um, many things. And, you know, the coronavirus brought a halt to the uh, all the protests uh, because of course, nobody could go ahead. Um, but government action, as I said, has continued. So in a way it's not a pause. Um, it's interesting to see what is kind of unfolding and what will unfold. I mean, if one looks at the newspapers and you look at the reports and you see what is happening, what begins to unfold is uh, makes you understand slowly what happens in a state of emergency or a state of exception. And what I feel is in, in India, uh, it, we're in a moment of transition. You know, and what happens in a moment of transition is, I think, very important because, also important because the um, next project I'm working on is the trial of Bahadur Shah Zafar, who was the last Mughal 
um, emperor of India. And the trial happened, his trial happened in 1858, just after the, what is called the mutiny of 1857 or the revolt of 1857 or the first war of Indian independence, because this was a short trial. It's a very important trial because we came directly under the British crown after this trial and as a result of the trial. But what happens during this time is that it's a year of um, it, it's a year of exception and it's a year of transition. And as I'm doing the research on the project, you begin to look at what happens to the judiciary, for example. One does some research into what happens with money during that time, who was funding what, um, you know. So it's quite interesting to think about this time and that time um, because it's about trying to fit pieces together. You know, when one reads different, um, if you read different news reports, like for example, now after Goa, uh, I'm sure you know Goa is one of our states, uh, you know, in 2018, the government had banned uh, mining there. Now, apparently in the last week, uh, a big mining company is trying to get it restarted because, you know, everybody needs jobs and, you know, this will provide it. Then you hear that the Supreme Court didn't feel or didn't was asking why is it important to pay migrant labor stuck here wages since apparently the government was giving them food. Anyway, then you, um, you know, read reports about that kind of hint at the fact that, you know, India is kind of preparing um, to give land to companies that might want to invest here who were based in China, for example. So it's interesting to kind of slowly try and fit it all together because some narrative begins to become clear. Um, and so that's what I have actually uh, spent some time doing because I'm interested in this, what happens during an exceptional time. Yeah, what happens. Yeah during a time, you know, what happens to various institutions and what happens, I'm, because I work, I'm interested in law and law as performance, of the performativity of law. I'm interested in also what happens with law and, you know, what fictions become reality at, in a moment like this and what is performed and therefore made real. It's not, it's not only, um, you know, it's not only artists who do it. It's not only artists who bring into being um, realities, um, you know. Yeah, so... Um, the right does it all the time. It does it all the time. So you said uh, earlier on, you said, it's a time to think about what we do, why we do it and for whom. Yes. Share, share a little bit. What are you thinking about? What are you... What's, what, is, what are your reflections at the moment? Um, well, when I was at this tribunal, I met, uh, I met a lawyer whom I know, and she asked me, uh, why don't you, have you ever thought of taking your, um, using the trial format out in the villages, uh, using some of the material, uh, you know, because, uh, one of so one of the pieces that I was due to travel to Melbourne with, and I couldn't because um, of the lockdown, is a historical trial that um, uh, that happened in India. It is a trial about an imposter, um, and the trial was about his identity. And it is an interesting trial because a it took sixteen years, and b um, it is an individual versus the state. So a very large estate uh, in undivided India was owned by three brothers. Uh, the middle brother apparently goes off 
to a hill station dies there um the other two die uh, brothers die and the estate which is a vast piece of land is taken by taken over by the british court of wards um one day uh, a man an ascetic or a, yeah like a monk um sort of 12 years after the um this man has died is come is found in dhaka what is now dhaka and recognized to be this brother who has died um basically the the court of wards refuses to recognize him and therefore he goes to court so it's an individual going against the state to uh, say it's me so it's basically about it's a case about identity um the melbourne project the melbourne version um so this this project is uh, in the form of a it's partly a reenactment partly a retrial um it has uh, this project has a judge a lawyer and myself it's called rehearsing the witness the bhaval court case one of the one of the things i'm interested in which came from this material was the actor as an imposter or the imposter as an actor so it really hinges on the actor at one level but it's also really looking at citizenship as performative mm -hmm. um you know and also as you said in your in your in your work you try to perform the truth i mean trials have been a, a legacy in 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 uh, in, in theater and uh, yes. uh of uh, of plays and now mila rao who did all the moscow trials the congo trials and um, henry von kleist you know is great qual place and and so many brecht and of course and others so it is what is true and that the truth has different sides and you look at it um in a uh, in a way that perhaps represents uh, laws that are more superior to justice that is at the moment and is not progressive justice antigone who says i will bury my brother even so it's against the law but you are breaking the law of mankind of ethics and morals and she in the way sacrifices her life um and for it it's unfortunate that all the heroines have to will have to die at the end should be the opposite but um do you do you uh, feel at the moment because performing memory is it is in the center of your work do you feel that what happens now in this moment when you are in delhi is that something where um a, a performance uh, uh, tradition will come out a way to perform this and will be something new will be, it will connect people because everybody shared that experience is there something what you detect in the indian theater scene new delhi theater scene where you feel this will be a changer it will be a game changer i i'm not sure i think i think we're uh, i think I, i'm not sure because of course at one moment it's a, it's a, it's a time to think and reflect and to see uh at the other, on the other hand of course you know everybody needs to get back to work it's not just about wanting to get back to work people also do need to get back to work um you know so it's 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 too difficult to tell at the moment actually what this moment with, will mean and as i said earlier this moment is one moment coming on top of a lot of moments yeah. in in delhi uh, and in india at this time it's been one thing after yeah. another it also and means that people in yeah people in kashmir who had the lockdown imposed by indian police now have another lockdown imposed by the same police you know as a, a Guillermo Calderon from Chile who said you know we were out in the streets uh, protesting in December the police were shooting into the eyes of protest about 400 shooting some of them killed but there was most probably an order and he said now the same police is pretending or trying to protect us and he said we can't go out we can't protest in Tunisia also like things are uh, are on hold so um it is a, a confusing um, um um situation and um Do, do you feel that um um theater will play or performance in india will play a role in kind of creating meaning sense out of it will people uh 
look at theater to um, to um, try to cope with this situation. Well, as I said, I'm, I mean, the, the the protest sites have actually emerged as a as as also a very um, creative space, um, and it's urgent. We're in an urgent moment now. You know, we're in one urgent moment after the next, and I think. Um, people in the theater are trying to respond to that in a number of ways. What One do they do? Tell us. Or, or even in the demonstrations or right now, what are Indian theater artists doing? Well, either you, I think either people, or certainly while the protests were going on, either people were trying to create new work as, as part of the protests, in the protests. Uh, I think there were also a lot of people involved in organizing protests because there were many simultaneously in Delhi, for example, it was not just one site, it was all over the city. Um, and a lot of people were involved in the organization of that. Um, there subsequently when the violence in Delhi happened, I know that a lot of people were organized in relief efforts. So, you know, organizing food and um, medical attention to people. And as a result of that, actually in this moment, there have been already a lot of networks set up, uh, which people are using now because there yeah. are, um, you know, there are a huge amount of NGOs, um, nonprofit um, organizations, uh, and, you know, people like Abhishek who are involved in, uh, and Anurupa who are involved in organizing, making sure that, you know, finding out where there are pockets of people who have not received food by government relief efforts, haven't reached, or they haven't received it for whatever reason, and then putting out calls for donations so that, you know, um, people donate uh, and so they can get enough food. and. Um, I think that I think that's equally important. Yeah, I think it's very important. Um, and Abhishek yeah. said he cannot read, he cannot write, he can't sleep in the night. All he does is immediate help. It's impossible to even really consider this. Except he said that theater is important. He felt uh, because government is forbidding it, so there must be something uh, of significance. Otherwise, they wouldn't try to censor it. Meanwhile, films people don't care, but in theater, um, well, the thing that. For example, that happened with Abhishek's play, I think last year or year before last, um, where it had to suddenly be shut down because uh, there was a group of right wing, a right wing group that showed up and the police apparently said, you know, told Abhishek, this is what I heard and what I read that um, it was, they wouldn't necessarily be able to protect them. Um, I think what is more concerning rather than looking just at, you know, whether the government prohibits things or not, the state is that the situation is that it's suddenly a situation where any right wing group can come and threaten your performance and somehow there is no one to protect you. I mean, how could the police say that, I'm sorry, we may not be able to protect you. And that is really worrisome for me, because it means that this is not just about, um, you know, this is not just, it's not so simple anymore. It's really about, there was a production that happened recently, uh, two months ago in Delhi, where apparently somebody in the audience was offended uh, and made a police report. You know, this is, this is to me more more concerning, yeah. you know, because society is also now deeply polarized. And how does one kind of deal with that? You know, um, when the prime minister asked us to, as he recently did, to switch off all our lights and, you know, light uh, candles, for people who didn't, uh, their neighbors gave them a really hard time, right? This should mm -hmm. be a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
and they gave them a hard time and i'm i'm putting it i'm um, i'm putting it gently yeah. uh, this is more concerning I, i feel and india will have to think where as a country it is going as a one of the two models of what is happening in china as a world power but also india is such a strong powerful country and what models will both uh, societies find and we do all hope that india will stay on the side of openness on the side of uh, fairness on the side of, um, of social uh, progress it was the great philosopher isaiah berlin who predicted early on that nazis never would win because he said it's a linear system one person is in power they might move very fast but if this one person is wrong there's no control mechanism there's no the dialogue and that's why democracy as painfully slow as it is will be always superior as a system in itself and we all hope that india um, will stay on the side that signs are not encouraging and uh, our heart reaches yes, out for every yeah yes. to everybody who is suffering it's uh, unprecedented i feel that uh, such a big crisis is provoked by by a virus well as i said this is also from before the virus the mm -hmm. virus has uh, you know not made the situation easy and it's allowed for uh, a bunch of things to happen with our, and because nobody can go out and protest it's just happening it's uh, just happening yeah so your work right. is so significant and important so how do you how do you spend your day now tell us a little bit when do you get up what do you do do you find time to write as a theater artist a director what do you do in your neighborhood in your apartment in new delhi well day? uh i i have uh i i um i have two kids i have two dogs um so the day i spend my day doing some housework uh luckily my kids are on some other schedule which means they only get up much later in the evening because my son still has classes um he said and by is in america both kids study in america right uh so my son is in chicago so he has classes mm. so he's up in the middle of the night because of the mm -hmm. time difference his classes uh so i mean the day is quite uh, my daughter has just finished uh, high school so she's supposed to be in college in america in september but we don't know how that's going to pan out uh so i spend some time um doing household stuff through the day uh i run a theater archive so i still have that work that i do through the day I spend some part of my day um thinking uh I spend some part of my day researching my uh, my new project um and by the evening we all go on the terrace and spend some time with the dogs I look for rain every evening because it's now getting very hot um and then the kids and i try and spend some time um over you know uh either looking at listening to talks or talking about um art and activism it seems uh is the general topic of conversation at the moment um and uh, the day is pretty filled actually between all of this um it's not so difficult for me i feel uh i'm i'm in a way i'm in a way quite happy to have the time and i suspect it's also one ha will have to adjust to what it means not to be traveling around the world uh as often as one does i think what does it mean when one says you know there's a lot of oh the world must change and it all should change i think this is not so easy when you think about it in terms of one's own life what does this mean when will we choose not to travel as much as we do i think about that a lot because i feel that you know as everybody has said there are some warning signs over here about what's to come and what can come could be worse than this and what does it mean to actually um take that on it's not just words to say things should change actually that has ramifications for all of us in our day to day lived life um right shall i uh shall, how many times a year will i be able to travel should i travel if i can travel um 
what does it mean in terms of uh you know how i how i live my life and how i am with people i work with and for people who work for me what does this mean in terms of my interaction with them um i think it's not going to be that easy and i and i personally am not sure that there's going to be a big change because while I, while everybody says they want it everybody is also trying to get back to a normal right um so i mean i, I think it's um uh, i for me it's a curious time because i don't know what's to come i don't know if it will get worse if it will be better um if it will stay the same it's too uh, if it it feels too uh, soon to tell and it feels like this could easily be just a small couple of months that we'll remember that we all had to sit down at home and we could you know and we weren't allowed to go out um so i, I i'm not sure i feel it's quite a difficult moment to assess i feel it's important to be able to do what one can do so yes if one can donate one should uh if one can look at what is to be done for um the ecosystem of theater because it's a very deep ecosystem there are uh artists who work with traditional forms who you know should be making uh engagements uh and because they have to go out and perform so that they have money for the rest of the year they're not they're not being able to do that and so you know there are organizations and people who are also crowd funding for them for different kinds of artists for street performers and so the time is spent actually with that uh and i i think that that's very important i think it's very important to stop thinking about oneself and to think about uh, other people and think of ourselves as a community which um seems to have happened at the moment you know everybody i feel is uh quite concerned about one another uh and is not necessarily thinking about well when can i do my next show you know and i think that's very positive i think the last 3 4 5 months have been a rehearsal for this time also to build network networks of support uh you know which are coming very much uh, in use um so i think i think that's that's quite critical and important i think in terms of my own work having to think about this present moment and how one since i do work with historical material how does how does his, what does historical material what can it reveal about this present moment that we're in uh about you know states of exception questions of identity um and actually quite a lot of issues that you know are at stake in india at the moment um that's important to me the form that it takes uh as i said i've been working with the trial formats you asked a little uh, earlier what that what i meant when i said where do i show the work so far i've shown the work in you know um mostly uh, in sort of a visual arts context so in a biennale or a situation like that um and these uh, and i'm asking myself whether these are the only places i can show my work or should show my work uh because after all what is one what is the work about the work is about unfolding or questioning actually what art does in in one way my series landscape as evidence artist as witness puts the artist as a witness and their art is evidence so the question is if art claims uh and which i believe it can also do whether it's you know if we're saying that art asks an old question in a new way or um puts forward a new claim um what happens when you put that material in a place like a court um can it do that uh does it do that because i i mean i i do believe that 
um, what art generally can, if, if I was to kind of be very general about it, is that it, yes, it can re-articulate something. It can reveal something. And that's very important if one has to find new perspectives, find other ways to look at, you know, something that seems to not be shifting out of its status quo. But I also feel that this has to be put to a test. And that's partly what my projects do. Um, the, the, the project is self-reflexive. It's also a question to myself and what I do. Um, on the other hand, the historical projects of trials, as I said, is a way to, to look back into history a bit to see, uh, to try and see if one can trace where, where we are right now. The question of identity is very important at this point in time. Who the government, the government is asking people at this time with, uh, you know, the CAA and NRC to basically take the onus on oneself to prove that one is the citizen. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a, we have a lived experience of, you know, there are people who are born here, who've spent generations here to be asked now to prove you are who you are. Uh, you know, uh, it's something to be considered. It's something to be thought through. And of course, then as the protests, they challenge it because the protests uh, earlier in the year, basically people were saying, I will not show my identity papers. I won't do it, uh, you know, which is an exceptional and unusual thing to say. But I think it's important to think about who one speaks to, speaking to you know, am I speaking to uh, yeah, visual art spaces, art elite spaces anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, am I preaching to uh, the converted? Yeah. Um, you know, am I wanting, who, who am I wanting to do what? I think that's a very, very important question at this point of time. In as much maybe questions of form and aesthetics, um, uh, in as much as it might be conceptual or, you know, theoretical, I think where, if one chooses to do this kind of work, one can't put, push it to only a singular point. One has to then see, uh, and if it's a question of reality, and if it's a question of you're trying to, you know, you're trying to do what, in any case, I'm beginning to feel, as I said earlier, the right does exceptionally well now, which is bring make fiction into fact mm -hmm. very quickly and very strategically and very effectively. And we've seen that play out, not just in India, we've seen it play out in most parts of the world. And then one has to really think about, okay, but then, you know, what is it that I'm, what is it that I can do and does it have any meaning and resonance and relevance and can it, can it actually make a change? Um, you know, and as I said, to me, it was really profound to be part of these protests, which really brought forth, it made something that is in one's head and in one's heart, it made it very real real enough for it all to be shut down pretty super fast and, you know, people hauled off uh, to jail. So, I mean, it's a critical question for me. I, I'm beginning to hear from other people and I think it's a critical question for a, a lot of people in the arts, thinking about what they do, who they show it to, um, and what does it mean to say we want a change or we want to work towards a change. And that's not going to necessarily happen if we continue to show our work where we show it, if we do our work as we normally do it. I mean, at this time, it's quite clear that we can do quite a lot of work sitting at home. We can speak to people all across the world. Um, and yes, it's lovely to be able to fly, fly across the world and actually meet them. But it's also very possible to work in this way. Uh, and is it something that one should continue to do because it's more sustainable? 
um, you know, can one's time also, as I said earlier, should it only be devoted to doing one's own work or uh, I'm deeply impressed by a lot of people I know because they're putting all their time um, into organizing um, food, organizing uh, money for uh, different artists. And of course I participate in that. And actually that's what my conversation uh, with my kids is about, uh, is about as well, is that how does one move from here when one thinks one is an artist or one is doing artistic work? What does that actually mean? Um, you know, what, what does it mean in terms of what one does? Is it only about going into rehearsal spaces and working there? Is it about really thinking about who you work with? And that, um, you know, the process of rehearsal and working is also um, equally important in terms of when you choose who you want to work with and what that means for them. What does that mean for you? Uh, and, and, and how does it reach out, I think, is because it's very easy to just get stuck in a theater and think this is it, you know, and make all the big changes um, on the stage and think that one has done everything. I, I think that is important, but I think it's also important to do more. At least that's what the last year has meant for me. And to think about how 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 that is possible because in one way or the other people have really been putting themselves at risk you know whether it's um, somebody who chooses to go out and actually at this point whether with a mask or not uh, and with gloves or not you're handing out food you're out there in the open you're meeting hundreds of people that's a risk because. whether you are yeah, whether you are organizing uh, a protest at a point when you know that the police can come down at you, that the government can come down at you, and you go on doing it, that's a risk. And so it's important, I feel, for my children at least, and that's who I'm talking to at the moment, to understand, to understand that that's also a part of it. Yeah, yeah, I think we really um, are forced to, 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 to face these uh, existential questions we all know about. Also death, uh, you know, that is happening now around us and, uh, and which always has happened anyway. I mean, we had uh, Aristide Tanarda who said 400,000 people die of malaria every year in, in Africa. No one cares. Uh, we don't even have money for measles vaccinations and... Uh, so for us, as you say, that's one of the many things. And but I think it is a time really to 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 go so deep inside. So thank you really for sharing. It was very meaningful for me to hear what you say and what you think. And it will be also interesting to see where it will go because if you perform uh, uh, memories and uh, um, so now how will that find a form to re and also reach people? And as um, Mila Rao also said in that old Brechtian idea, it's no longer enough to represent the world as it is. It's time to change and to call for action. And uh, so this is something we hear in new spaces outside the, um, the traditional ones. If it had worked what we did, perhaps the world already would be different, but perhaps also we have to ask ourselves in this theater community and performance, maybe something that hasn't been working fully, maybe as we accuse politicians to have forgotten about the workers, the healthcare workers, the people who put their life at risk. Maybe we also have forgotten about them as potentially as not just being audience, but to, as humans who come to share our experiences and we have to reach out and, and to them. So really, thank you so much. And I'm sure we will thank check you in that. with you and India, um, uh, what is uh, happening there. It is so, uh, so, so traumatic also and so, um, so significant. And I hope it will find a way uh, to steer that big ship in the right direction and the voices of artists and your work and to tell truth. And this is what it is about in law, but as well as in in art and in science, it's about the truth, and there is a truth, and something is truthful, and it's just a, 
a compass we can we can follow. So thank you so much. Our next uh, program tomorrow will be with uh, Stacy Klein from the Double Edge Theater a Farm uh, outside in New York City, where they do uh, work for many decades. You know, and the, the tradition of a physical theater, perhaps, or from not connected to Eastern European um, in a way, very unusual. And then with her, Stephanie will have we will have with uh, Stacy Klein. We will have Stephanie Monceau who once the New York City Bendels, the family circus, uh, also a, sing a significant art form, a popular art form that has been perhaps overlooked, I think, in France uh, with the Cirque Nouveau movement, over 400 companies are doing fantastic and great work. I think it still has to develop and catch on, I think, in the Americas. Canada uh, perhaps is doing um, a better job with, with Toho and others, you know, but uh, these are also um, 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 things we have to. How, what does it mean for these communities in Corona time? How are they going to survive? What does it mean? And circus, of course, is about traveling. Is about connecting, having many people, families coming in, and it's all not, not possible. But um, again, um, really, truly, truly, like us, thank you so much for for taking the time, and for sharing this. And um, well, where your work is so important, is significant. You act locally, but you think globally. And you are a great representative of our community, the one we know also of the world of performance and theater. And uh, congratulations. And we admire all of you, Abhishek, Anarupa, and you. And, uh, and I hope one day you will come uh, back to New York and, um, and we can see or I come for a visit. So thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, you know how much is going on and how much also is online. And uh, we also have to be careful. And uh, <clears throat> as... Um, um, Lula Arias said from Argentina in a great uh, contribution uh, on Monday, she said, you know, I, I'm i alone in, in a way, but I'm not really alone. I'm with my family. I don't even have the time where I could normally create. And I'm with my family, but also not with my big community. So she said, it's such a strange time. And she looks since seven weeks out of her window, being, seeing the same trees whose names she likes to learn. So, um, so it's an unusual time. So thank you for all of those who do listen that we can be part of that um, that time, I think it's very significant to hear the voices also from around the world and to not just um, our own experiences. And um, and I hope you all will be back. Thanks to HowlRound for taking on to host us every day during the week. We are the only theater institution, as far as we know, in the Americas, uh, perhaps also European, that every day produces new content related um, to this. So um, this is quite um, quite an exceptional time also for us. And thank you to the Siegel team, Andy Sun Young and uh, Jackie. So thank you and uh, good luck and bye-bye. Stay thank tuned. You.